after I saw my mom get put in the back of a cop car that night, I was just like, it just really had had that moment of clarity realizing, holy crap, Mm. like I come in a household full of alcoholism. Mm. I have a very special friend here today. His name is Nick. I, I don't want to slaughter your last name, but how do you say it? It's Fajeda. It's Brazilian Portuguese. Okay. But some of us think that your name is Nick Ferrari. At least it looks like that on Facebook. So, Nick, welcome to The Corner. Thank you. I've been uh, talking to you about having you on here for a while. Blood gratitude. Blessed. Okay, good, good. Um, so, we're going to delve into your past in just a sec, but uh, before we get started please do subscribe to the channel. Also uh, push like and share this everywhere. Um, let's get the message of hope out there. And so let's hear from Mr. Nick. Nick, uh, tell us about yourself. Where were you born? Where was I born? This legend right here was born in uh, a city outside of Chicago, Illinois, called uh, Rockford, Illinois. Rockford, it's, Illinois. Uh, it's right outside of uh, Chicago. It's an hour northwest. Um, it's one of the in the top five for the biggest cities in the state, and also now, as we speak now, it's also one of the dangerous cities in the United States. Most well. dangerous? Mm hmm Okay, so you growing up in the outskirts of Chicago or near Chicago, Rockford, uh, did you have brothers and sisters? Yes. Okay. I have two brothers. One's older. His name's Mike. He's about two and a half years older than me. And then I have my younger brother, Julian. He's uh, about five and a half years younger than me. And uh, he's, uh, they're both, so I'm the middle brother. Middle brother, okay. Growing up out there, um, how was school growing up? Were you a good student? Yes, um, I, I was a good student. Um, I was uh, okay at school. Um, growing up in the Midwest, it was like you saw cornfields everywhere. And, uh, you know, it was pretty, you know, we loved, I love the outdoors. The weather over there is just, especially in the winters. Super cold. It's like bipolar. <laughs> <laughs> I was just in in uh, Chicago last week, and yeah, even at this time of year, like springtime, it was like thirty thirty five yeah, in it, the daytime. It, it has it seriously has no soul. Like it, it does not care what if it's hail, sunny, winter, hailing the next day. It's a whole nother ball game. Mm -hmm. um, but school, I school was good. Um, I got along with a lot of uh, friends too. Uh, growing up there. Um, I had uh, I had a fun time going to school um, there as well because uh, it was Michael Jordan was very a big hit at that time and I grew up watching the Bulls and uh, that was fun and I always loved playing basketball with a lot of my friends that were African American. And How old are you right now? I'm 37 years old. How long are you sober? 12 years. Okay. Growing up, did you ever have problems with people? Were you ever picked on or anything yes. like that? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, I was picked on because, like, talking about school, uh -huh. I was, uh, I got put in special ed at second grade okay. because I do have a learning disability, okay. and uh, it's basically, it's ADD, and, like, I have a really, I, if I'm in a real big class where, like, there's no extra teaching how to do things properly, I'm lost. Okay, and, uh, so when you got put, what, what, did you get put on medication? Uh, I was put on, not until about fourth grade, um, I was put on Ritalin. Ritalin. And then when they put you on Ritalin, was, did that help? Were you hyper? Were you a hyper kid? I could pay attention a lot, a little bit better. Because okay. um, but... a lot of times they give kids uh, Ritalin because they're hyper and it calms them down. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was more... This I was... was more for... for, for... Focus, because the focus. Yeah, me when I'm like I don't understand things or anything else, and I'm just like not getting the help that I need, and I'm just I just start to get lost, and then I just lose the drive to like really. I'm just like I don't know what I'm doing here. So did did the Ritalin help you with your attention? Yeah, deficit yeah, to a certain extent. Um, as a young kid, you how know, long were you on it? Uh, how old was it when I first got on it? I was about nine, eight years old, ten. And you then, know. and then, how long were you on it? Uh, till about. About I think three years maybe. Three years. And then um and then just that and also I was picked on because I was uh I had a weight issue. I Were I, you overweight? Yeah, I was overweight. Okay. I was fat. I was uh that was a that was kind of a challenge. Um so I just I always had that inferiority complex of mm -hmm. 
feeling like I wasn't smart enough. And mm-hmm. but I was so grateful my mom put me in special ed at the time because right. I was struggling. Oh, here's one that was on my four step. Um, I had this teacher in first grade, mm-hmm. and I was in a regular class at that time. And uh, thank God my mom really kept close to, uh, you know, I love my mother. Like, she really was a big help my entire life. She really looked out for me um, and love her still to this day. Uh, basically, she put me in special ed because she saw my homework that our teachers would give to me uh, at the time. And she, my teacher was one of those old school old ladies that was so old school where she just yelled, screamed, and she would take her two fingers and like, Go like this, think, think, think. I'm like, I'm struggling. Right. And it would make me cry, you know. And uh, she would put the letters in big red, red uh, writing on mm-hmm. top. Right. With capital letters, think with exclamation points on the top. And that's when my mom was like, yo, this is wrong. Like, you know, so that's when. So my, you weren't just getting picked on by kids, you were getting picked on by the t- teacher? Yeah, teacher. Yeah. It was very uncomfortable. And, um, so my mom, thank God my mom put me in special ed and I got the help I needed. And thank God for those rooms of special ed because I, I stayed in special ed till I basically graduated high school. Now, you said you were overweight. Were you overweight all throughout that period? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I just, uh, until basically once I got into like, you know, second, third grade, fourth grade, fifth, fifth grade, mm-hmm. sixth grade, seventh grade, you know, and then so rewind uh, we left Illinois in 1997, um, and then we moved to California because my dad got a job at the time. He for his career, he was an engineer. Mm-hmm. You know, he uh, is from originally Brazil, mm-hmm. and he came to the United States in you know the 70s and went to school. I don't know, you know, um, and came out here and uh, he strived and worked hard and had you know me and my other brothers and he moved us all out to California in 1997. And uh, we moved to Huntington Beach. Were you excited to move out to California? I, I was at the time, you know, it was cool and we didn't, we wouldn't have to deal with the snow anymore. But as a kid, I just didn't know better. I was kind of like, kind of like I was maybe going to miss Illinois just because I, you know, grew up. But on the other hand, we moved to California and it's just like, yeah, it's better to live here. So how old were you when you moved to California? 10 years old. Okay. 1997. And then when you said you were overweight, how did you, did you lose weight? I, I, uh, no, I still stayed kind of mediocre. I think food and sugar was like my first addiction. And this was throughout your, uh, even into your adolescent period, were you eating and Yeah, eating I just, I would eat just because of just, uh, I. Eating your feelings, perhaps? Eating my feelings, yeah. You think and, you had, uh, uh, I played hockey as a kid. Mm-hmm. I, sports was my escape. I love sports still to this day. Okay. Passionately. And, um, and I just, I worked, I've always loved to think, cause that was like, I grew up in a household where there was a lot of verbal and emotional abuse and a lot of, uh, you know, I didn't know how to deal with the feelings. Like yeah. my dad would come home and my brothers would just go in and uh, rush to our rooms and close the door. Oh okay. yeah. So it was that type of environment. Uh-huh. Yeah. When was the first time that you ever tried drugs and alcohol? Huh. Like illicit drugs. Okay. All right. Well, I tried alcohol. You know, at a young age, because uh, I, you know, that feeling where it feels like you just want to fit in mm-hmm. and you just want to think. My relatives from Brazil, like even at a young kid, I was like 11 years old, and uh, my uncle from Brazil and his and my cousins, they're all females, and uh, my aunt, they stayed at our house during uh, Christmas time of uh, basically 98 going into 99. And uh, they stayed over at our house in Huntington Beach. And uh, my uncle was just cool. He was just like the total opposite from my dad. My dad was strict and just like, you know, don't you do this and just yell. You know, my mm-hmm. uncle was like, we don't care. He's my but we're we're buds, you know. And so he he gave me some of his beer and tried to give him a champagne. And when I was like, I think eleven, eleven that young, <laughs> yeah. And so it didn't hadn't clicked yet. I was like, man, why do people drink this stuff? Like, <laughs> did you just have one or did you have a few? I just had a few sips. And I tried to act cool, just holding it. <laughs> yeah. But it didn't, it didn't, you didn't like it. Yeah. I was like, man, this ain't that great. What, why is this man? And so, um, and, and I think a lot of kids when they first ever try alcohol, especially strong stuff. Yeah. Um, 
they might be doing it because of some kind of composure. They have to look a certain way in front of people. Yeah, and I for me, I just I just felt so off. Like I was just like my just because my own self delusion of like being I'm five seven, mm. like and uh, being five seven, overweight, and just like uh, just feeling like I was never gonna own up and i came from midwest of california and i was like man how is everyone looking good and looking in shape and how am i going to compete with these people that's just how my brain was working and uh so I, let's go back to having first alcohol and then i went down to brazil the following year after mm -hmm. that and my i had a little bit of a, a cachaça which is like a brazilian um uh, mm -hmm. sugarcane rum and uh and it's with caipirinhas, which are very uh, well-known cocktail in Brazil. And I tried it. It was strong. It's just like, holy crap. And I was like, oh, my God. Right. <laughs> and uh, my uncle, again, was uh, let me taste it. I'm like, dude, this isn't. Nah. So I just stuck with my Coca-Cola. And <laughs> So you just had a little bit of that? Yeah, a little bit of it. And then. Well, did it get you buzzed? No, 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 no. You didn't no, even want it. Not, not even yet. And then my cousins, they're like. One of them was 18. One of them was even even younger than that when they were eight, uh, younger than 18 in their teens. Like, they were drinking. In Brazil, they don't care. Like, yeah. he, here, it's like a death sentence. Oh, you've been drinking? Oh, you're getting penalized and everything. No, down there, they don't care. Not even. And then, um, so, so here's eighth grade was a highlight of my year because uh, I was in Huntington Beach at Dwyer Middle School. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I really got serious about my weight and uh, I wanted to really stop, uh, you know, eating. I s would never eat lunch during eighth grade and go to the cafeteria. And uh, I just did that. And and then really that's when, you know, I hit t a puberty at a very young age at like sixth grade, yeah. seventh grade. I just started growing facial hair, started growing, you know, you know what I mean. And then uh, did you grow a beard like the one you have right no, now? No, no, I hadn't been able to do that, that, that yet. That, that beard is like royalty. Oh yeah, it's healthy. Oh yeah, love it. I love it. It's, I get it from my dad too. So he came. He grew out his beard uh, when he was young in college at Mizzou, and um, so so that's when I was able to really start feeling feeling good about myself. Was when I lost was losing the weight in eighth grade, and I was going into high school the following year. Yeah, and uh, man, I was feeling sexy. I was just like, oh my god, finally, you know, and like and. Uh, Started, that's so when you I, lost the weight and lost the weight, and I started working out at age thirteen years old, and J just natch natural. I've always been natural my whole life. Thank God. You never did steroids. Never ever. Never have. Still to this day. Okay, but here's the thing: there has been um, some. I've seen some of your posts on Facebook, and did did someone ever say something to you? Like, did did people claim that you do roids? They. After working the four step on that one, um, a lot of people did try to say you take steroids and everything else, and that never offended me, ever. Still doesn't offend me. People said that to you? Oh yeah. <laughs> Why? What would make them think that? Jealousy or insecure uh -huh. or just, and but they don't know me. They don't know what I do when no one's you know looking. They uh -huh. don't know what I do. The, the the real work is when no one's watching and you're doing it on your own time, which is I would I started working out in my garage mm -hmm. in Huntington Beach at our home. My right. dad showed me a little things, right? Yeah. Showed me workouts and and because of just my background and just my stuff that I struggle with and insecurities with appearance issues, like I, I took that and I ran with it. Mm. I I didn't want to stop because I knew that that was like that passion for fitness found me. And uh, it was first love at sight. So I mean, whatever works. No, I mean personally, me because I similar story. I moved out to California in high school. Yeah, from Utah. From Utah, fifteen years old. Um, there was definitely a status quo. Like you had to like look good, uh -huh. or I tried, and I had major body dysmorphia. I was either too thick or too thin. Um, I will say that I. I um I started doing steroids at seventeen. Yeah, I really did. I mean, yeah. I I did them because yeah. I had a lot of people around me that were doing them too. Yeah, yeah. So um, I did them, and I I saw a major difference in my body yeah. and my shape and the way yeah. I was looking. Um, and so I kept doing them. Yeah. Right, and um, uh, it was an on and off thing that I did all the way through throughout my twenties. Um, and I've actually watched a lot of people have major. Uh, health effects as a result yeah, of it. Yeah, so. and it's it's insane because I've known some people that have done them, but for me, I just 
I was just so in my head to be like, don't give in to that. Cause yeah. uh, I just, the amount of just, but just the roid rage and just the, just cause that stuff messes with you. Mo- Major roid rage. Mo- yeah. M- mentally and emotionally. Acne on the back, yeah, roid yeah. rage. And you can. Insecurities. Yeah. I mean, I've had a lot of friends that have literally enlarged hearts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Heart attacks. Yeah. Um, and then what was it? Uh, suicide. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, as a result of depression because they never felt like they were enough. So, mm-hmm. so you're all natch. All natural. Already. All all, natural, always been man. natural. All natural. And uh, I'm. Friendly. When people would say this to you that you did steroids, what would you tell them? I just, I just sit there and I just laugh and I just go, no, nah, man. And I don't get mad because what's there to be mad about? Because it's like because you know you're not doing. I'm it. not doing it. I have yeah. no, no, nothing to hide. And uh, but because here's why I'm able to gr- grow muscle where a lot of people are just come out to me, Nick, man, how do you like how do you grow so much muscle? Well, you ever heard the three body types: mesomorph, endomorph, and ectomorph. I've heard those. I'm an endomorph uh-huh. where I have to watch what I eat. And also for my build and my stockiness, like I can put on muscle, no problem. And are you I, able to eat bad? I when I do, I can gain weight, fat, like quick. Yeah. And uh, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. So that means if you have a, a Sunday or, it, or yeah, like, I have to really watch. And uh, because it's like when I have sugar too, it's like I want more. Right. And, and it's like I just have to. Because eh. you eat it addictively. Oh yeah. Uh huh. And. Uh, and um, so we're in your addiction. Uh, how long were you using and drinking? Uh, so I so I finally, after being at Huntington Beach High School, yeah, my first high school didn't didn't party. I hung out with my brother and his friends, and I've knew his friends forever. They were cool with me, and I you know they were cool. I did wrestling uh, for for a couple years, and then uh, and then once you know my brother graduated high school. Um, I was, we were planning on moving to San Clemente from, this was, we already planned it, and we were just waiting for our time to move, so Mm -hmm. three months left in my junior year, because I didn't go out and party in Huntington, I didn't have a car, I didn't really, didn't really, I just, also, here's the reason why I didn't really party at Huntington, Mm -hmm. Um, I just felt like, because my brother was top dog at that school, I felt like the dog on the leash, Mm -hmm. and uh, it was like, Every, all the girls were just like, oh, you're so-and-so's brother. Oh, that's so cute. My instant reaction was like, oh, great. I'm not getting laid. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I'm like, great. Oh, you're too young. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Right. And it's like, great. Well, I don't want nothing to do with you. Forget you. <laughs> right. And But because my, uh, my brother also got involved with a lot of like women to the point where that women sent out to sent, uh, you know, uh, women sent uh, men out to try and you know hurt him physically and fight, yeah. and because of just you know a lot of stuff, and just because my brother can also, he can do some things where it's like it's kind of dishonest, you know, in a way where it can piss people off, and so that led to a lot of things. And because I was his brother, they looked at me like they hated me, and I would get, I would be walking out of my house, and people would be driving by from our school, flipping me off, and everything because I was the brother. It's yeah. like great dude really and it's like but i started after all that and then finally i transferred to san clemente high junior year Mm -hmm. the two months left of my junior year it felt like i had my own identity for the first time and i joined the football team and i always wanted to do football i did that and uh really strived hard still worked out like a maniac and then um after finally going to a new high school and I finally, like, as if I had wings on my back for the first time. And then I gave in a drinking because I had that unease and comfort that basically we all struggle with. Yeah. And it was like, God. And so I started working at Albertsons at the time as a bag courtesy clerk. And uh, and I went to my coworker's house. He lived next door. And my brother went with him, and we went to his house. And, and then we played uh, this p- ping pong game where – if you hit the cup, the person has to take a chug of this tequila, Jose Cuervo and yeah. Seven Up, and I was and I sucked at it, so I was the one chugging and chugging, and then I got drunk for the first time, and it was like seventeen years old. That's when I was like, "Where has this stuff been my whole life?" <laughs> and then, then it was off to the races. Off to the races after that, and uh, man, 
it was like I depended on it. So and you were on the football team. You're drinking with your buddies. Uh huh. Yeah. And this became a regular thing. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. And, and how long did that last for? All, all throughout high school? Yeah, all throughout high school. Did you finish high school on time? Oh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Okay. And then uh, did you get into other drugs? I, so uh, I started, I started, I smoked weed for the first time in a, a, a senior year in high school at San Clemente at a, it was at, in the desert with uh, one of my brothers, uh, his college friend. Uh, we went to this party out there where he was from and we went out there for New Year's and I smoked a bowl for the very first time. And uh, did you like it? That's it was like whatever. It was like finally like, hey, I tried it, but I didn't really get the high so much because it was just one hit. I didn't know what to expect. But I was like, okay, I did it, whatever. Wasn't so sure if I'll do it again. And then as that went on, the progression was going and going up here. Yeah. To be like, I may not do it, whatever, if I don't, okay. Then finally, that uneasy comfort was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'll just, you know, whatever. And uh, I start. I graduated high school and uh, finished high school, no problem. And uh, and then I started because I had a car, a Mercedes Benz at the time, mm. and uh, that was my first car. And uh, f- finally, I got a. I t- was driving a lot, so I was like, you know, I can't drink and drive, but I'll I'll smoke and drive, right? So smoke weed, smoke weed and drive, and that so one. On and popping? Yeah, yeah. And, Smoking uh, all the time? Yeah, and just whenever I can get my hands on it, you know, to the point. But I, I worked, you know, I, I had a full-time job, and I did I did, I did, did stuff responsibly what I had to do, what I had to do. But when I was able to go and do whatever, I was like, hey, I'll just do this, and then, and then I'll just wake up the next day and just get my, you know, active routine going and just do that. And I wasn't every day because I still loved fitness. I still worked out, still did all the stuff I loved, but... Mm-hmm. I made some room for, you know, when I had to be able to do some fun stuff like smoke weed or drink, whatever. And then, um, so I, so I did that for a while. And then I went to Saddleback the next day. I'd only took two classes a semester. And, but because I started partying and started doing all that stuff, like, uh, I, uh, I didn't really, I, school was just not, not really on my agenda. My self delusion of feeling like not really passing school was just like, well, I'm not really into this stuff. I'm just going to it because it's like, you know, I, I kind of have to in a way and, Mm -hmm. you know, and everything. And I just, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, to be honest. And, uh, so I just, I made some room for on the weekends. I went to go party, smoke weed, do all that, and then go back to my normal like job and everything back then fitness, everything else. And, and because my, because I was doing that, my dad was extremely super controlling mm-hmm. where he was just like trying to not get me to party and, and everything else. And it's, and my excuse was like, how are you going to keep a Brazilian kid from not partying? That's part of our DNA. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was born here in the United States, but I'm half Brazilian and I'm using that as an excuse to protect my right to drinking. Right. <laughs> so and, did you just go on and drink like, yeah, whatever. So, but you got sober at 27. Huh? How, how long are you sober? I got, I, be, I got sober. At 25. 25. Did you, from the time that you graduated high school and you're smoking weed and you're drinking, did you get into other drugs? Not yet. I got into, I tried cocaine for the first time. Uh, How old were you then? I was 19. And I was working at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a a guy there that was uh, working there. And me and him loved to... us people, we like to find people that drink and use just as much as, yeah. you know, like we do. So how long did you do Coke for? Uh, for like small, like maybe a brief moment, like a month or so. Right. And uh, it was like the December of tw- uh, 20, no, 2006. And then... What else did you get into? Um, I just, I did, I did ecstasy for the first time at 23 years old in uh, 2010. And then those those were the ones that I only like did, but oh man, when I tried ecstasy for the first time, mm-hmm. like people were doing it ecstasy back in two thousand and six. From the moment I heard what ecstasy did to you, like it made you feel like you went like this and rubbed your arm, like it felt like such a body high, mm-hmm. and I was like, holy Jesus, I want to try that stuff out whenever if I ever. Did have you the do chance. it a lot? Um, I did it twice, twice, okay. and um. So when I when I did SC for the first time, because I was like, nah, I don't want to ruin and go down that route for uh, at an early age. So yeah. I waited. So once I turned twenty three years old, I was a, 
I was a Chippendale for Halloween. <laughs> That's what your costume was? Yeah. I just no shirt on and, and slacks and belt and a bow tie right here. Because you're buff? Oh, yeah. I was still f- in fitness and everything. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I want to tell you, too, uh, in the year of 2010, I weighed a hefty amount of uh, 225, just like fat and buff. And then I lost like in like a four month span, I lost like 45 pounds of 50 pounds of just like really started putting cardio. And then I lost the weight and then I was a shredded 175 mm. when I was there. And I really just got I was in addiction. So I was like I was but I also drank on the weekends. I was a big weekend warrior. Right. Like, and uh, but when I did ecstasy for the first time. I took one pill. My friend was like, don't, don't drink on top of it because it'll make you dehydrated and it can really mess you up. I was like, okay. So Ted, but then I took the pill and I had a sip of Bud Light, you know, to get it, chase it down. And uh, so we were going to the OC Fair at this little rave thing where a lot of people 21 and over are there to go, you know, do that and lights and just DJs. And, and as we're there, we get there. And my friend lost all the pills that we were supposed to take. So we had a sober driver taking us. He's like, hey, let's go back to San Clemente. We're in Costa Mesa. Let's go back to San Clemente and get the rest of the pills. We're like, eh, whatever. And then since we had a ride that was going to take us back, we're like, okay, let's not, let's not, you know, let's just not, you know, well, let's leave together and come back. Okay. So we go. And as we're coming back to San Clemente, I took another pill. And then, and as we get back in, you know, the car and go out to Costa Mesa, one of the pills freaking kicked in. And my armpits were feeling kind of moist and feeling like, oh, my God, I think it's hitting. And my friends, I'm like, hey, I was t- asking my friend Terry. I was like, Terry, you know, is this supposed to make your armpits feel moist and kind of sweaty? He's like, Nick, I, he's like, Nick, I lost my phone. Help me find it. Like, uh, pick up your phone and, like, uh, you know, look at it. And as I turn on my phone, I had an iPhone, the first ones, and I look and I'm just like, holy crap, dude, it's so bright. Oh, my God. And it's just like, and I'm like. I'm like, is this supposed to happen? He's like, Nick, you're melting, melting. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I'm just like going like this. I'm like, holy crap, dude. This is like, <laughs> he'll never, <laughs> still to this day, he never forgets the first time I rolled. And then uh, and then as we're going to the, to, the, to the rave, we get there. Oh, my God. All the chicks. Where, where was just, the rave? Oh, it was in the Costa Mesa fairgrounds. They had a rave? Yeah, they did. Costa Mesa? It was, it was fun. It was so fun. And we're there and. All these chicks were taking pictures of me and just going like this and and everything. You're buff. I just felt on top of the world, just like when you first drink, you just know. Just rolling, then, huh? Yeah, and then it was like, oh my god! And then, um, so why the hell did you get sober? <laughs> it seemed like you really had it going on. Well, yeah, but you know, here's why I got sober, man. Yeah, I want to hear that part. Here's here's why I got sober. After seeing all the chaos, all the dysfunction. All the verbal, the the rage from my father, like everything else, and seeing all that, and finally in 2011, it got pretty dark in my family's household. It got, you know, um, you you may have looked at our family and thought that looks a nice looking family, that big house, the cars, you know, everything else. From the outside, it looked good. Yeah, on the outside, it looks good. You stayed uh, if you happened to be in our home, you know. And uh, if we had a reality TV show, it mm-hmm. was like, oh, Jesus. Like, like a shit uh, show? So uh, just I resented my father big time. Mm-hmm. Like I was just like, you know, like I did not like how he was treating my mother. It was horrible, narcissistic too. And um, but I, you know, after seeing that and finally uh, seeing all the stuff from back when we were growing up in, you know, Illinois too. And so at all one night I came home from the gym, my dad basically was like nick your mother just hit me and my mom's just like no i didn't like my mom just like went like this like to his stomach hey i'm talking to you like that and cues and i'm like well dude bro the way how you're treating her you know i'm not surprised if she hit you or not (laughs) oh you you did anything to like offend him and not obey him oh it was like you just like took a you know you, it's like you really offended the king. You know what I mean? Like that kind of attitude. And then it led me to saying F you for the first time, like loudly at him. To and your like, pops. He tried to say like, get out of here. I was like, fuck you mother. F-, you know? Yeah. And, and so it was like, I wanted to find him. And because, and then the cops came that night because of that. Like, yeah. And so my mom knew she was an alcoholic from the eighties. And I didn't know, I would see her at home, you know, uh, 
uh, the Dr. Drew, yeah. the uh, celebrity rehab yeah. that show he had. Yeah. My mom would be watching that show as like I'm at home with her and we're just kicking it. I'm like going, I'm, I asked her, I think I was like, mom, why are you watching that show? Like, and she, and she's like, oh, it's good. And I'm like, but really she had a seed planted in her head already at that time. Yes. Really, like she was an alcoholic. And um, so basically seeing all that and everything else, let's get to the point here. After I saw my mom get put in the back of a cop car that night, I was just like, it just really had had that moment of clarity realizing, holy crap. Mm. Like I come in a ha- household full of alcoholism. Mm-hmm. And it was like, from that moment, I was scared. I was just like really, really scared. So what'd you do? So what did I do? I was desperate and I just, I, I tried to stay to my mother as close as possible. Um, still worked, still held on to a job. And, mm. uh, but I knew at that time too, I tried to do a bodybuilding contest and uh, I couldn't do it because I wanted to drink. My obsession to drink and use was so large, I couldn't defeat it on my own. I was like, I got to give up drinking and using and partying for this. And I wasn't emotionally and mentally ready for it. And um, so. So you quit on your own? Yeah. So I, my mom went to AA that following morning and has been sober ever since. Wow. And she has a little over 12 years sober. And she went to the San Kamei Friendship Center. And you know those little pieces of paper, the 20 questions? Yes. You know? And she had if an you extra... Feel, if you fill that out and just say yes to two of them? Three of them. Three, is it? Two, it's is three. It, yeah, it's three. Then, three or more, you're definitely an alcoholic. Then you're potentially an alcoholic. Yeah. <laughs> so I, she had an extra one. I was like, hey, mom, can I fill this out? She's like, yeah, sure. She's like, can you help me? And I, she's like, yeah. And I'm like, it goes, do you drink because you want to feel confident? And then I was a yes. Do you drink because you're shy? Oh, yeah, I was shy. Like, you know, to certain, like, especially women, because I was just like, I just felt yeah. like just my insecurities were just like, I don't think I have any potential. Like, uh, um, but basically I did that and uh, I was like, yes. And then it goes, do you hang out when you drink? Do you hang out with lower companions in an inferior environment? And yes. I was just like, I'm like, mom, what does this mean? Like, she goes, do you drink with people that are a lot worse than you? And also in a very low end environment. Yeah. And, and I'm like, oh, yes. oh my God. And that was my third. Yes. And it was like that piece of paper is like, this is no bullshit now, Nick. And I'm like, I'll answer these later. <laughs> I push it away. <laughs> and then I'm like, no, no, no. But that was like a moment that I finally realized like I'm powerless over alcohol. And, uh, my life was unmanageable. And then so the following five or six months after that, I tried to control and try to really stop. And, and because I was weaning myself down, but also having fun here and there, like I was like, I'm really going to really get serious. And then uh, finally, my last drink was March 18th of 2012. And it was the day after St. Patty's Day uh, that night. And um, I was like, if, like, if I can get one week sober, because I could never make it a week. I was like, if I can get one week sober... You know, I'm going to stay sober from here on out. And I finally made it one week. And I finally went to my first AA meeting uh, with seven days of sobriety. And uh, and thank God I sat in the front row. And I was going to Al-Anon previously before I went to AA. And that kind of helped me to be able to feel comfortable and actually be like, there's people that have gone through what you've gone through. Yeah. And uh, Al-Anon really helped me out. So thank God for them. Mm-hmm. And um, And so I went to AA. Because I needed to stop drinking. That's where you're going to AA for. So I went there and I saw the first three steps on the wall at 25 years old. And I was looking at the first three steps. Steps, I'm looking as if the steps were right there. I saw the first three steps. And I was like, powerless over alcohol in my life. So man, I'm like, absolutely, that is me 100%. And, you know, came to believe in a power greater in ourself could restore us to sanity. I was like, mm-hmm. I click with that one too. I absolutely understand what that means too. And then the f- third step was like, you hand yourself over to the care of God as you understood him. And I was like, turn it over. And I'm like, yep. And when I finally raised my hand as a newcomer, and I said, my name's Nick. I'm an alcoholic and I need help. And it was like, I'm here. I am here and now I'm safe. And, and then I started hearing everyone share. I was the last person to share at that meeting that day just because you know, they go around the room yes. and do that kind of standard, that kind of, uh, like that's round, part of their format. Round Robin. Uh, yeah. And so I was the last one to share and, and, uh, I just, 
I was sharing with my mother sitting next to me. I was sharing about how much I had suicidal thoughts and just like, I just felt like, you know, I just always felt different and what I was going through with family and stuff. And I just said I was scared to become like my father, you know? And uh, basically I was just like, I, I just, I want help. I want to, I came to get, come to AA to turn my life around and get a better life and without drinking or using. And you stayed sober since? I stayed sober since. So what do you do now to, uh, besides maintain your sobriety, because I, you seem like a person that's here to stay. Oh, so what do I do to maintain yeah. every single day when I wake up? What really got me to really stay in this thing mm-hmm. and um, is just being honest and open and the W, willing to be honest with your innermost self that if I, if anywhere that I'm next to strangers or anywhere that people are like, would you like an alcoholic beverage? Could you get any drink? Could you get a shot? I've had hot girls with short skirts ask me, do you want a shot? Have a shot with me. I'm like, I'm like, babe, I'm sorry. Well, well that, that's what brings us to where you work now. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, you're, you're a bartender. Yes, I am. And, um, how long have you bartended? I have bartended now. It will be, it will be four years this coming uh, fall. And um, so you were working in other jobs before. Now you're yeah, just I, bartending. Yeah, I'm bartending, and I'm a certified personal trainer. But I'm not really doing so much. I would love to get that going mm-hmm. here and there. Uh, but what really got me started to work in food and beverage as I became a bar back. Um, when my mom finally put up her two fingers and finally said, bye, Felicia, I'm out, you know, with my father. Because yeah. she got four years. She finally worked. Her, she had worked her steps already, but finally got to the point where she was like, we, before we went to Maine to go see my um, brother get married out there in the East Coast, because that's where his wife would spend her summers from being raised out in Detroit, Michigan. She would go to Maine to, for her summers, and uh, that's where they had the wedding. And uh so when we got back from Maine, she was like, you know, before we we're going, she's like, when I come back, like I'm moving out. And I was like, it got me that. And I had worked my steps already. So yes. thank God for that. And uh, finally, uh, she she moved out and she didn't look back when we got back. She was gone. She, we got back that day. She was gone the font like that same day. Like, I'm out. See you later. It was like, whoa. And uh, as a son. And uh but and then I had to live with my dad still at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, I was still going to AA and still admitting. And how it gets me to stay is, is admitting myself I'm an alcoholic and I cannot have any alcohol alcohol at all in any shape or form. Do you ever get tempted when you're at work bartending? Um, do I ever get tempted? Uh, does that fleeting thought thinking come? You know, comes like, hey, you know what? It's like, you know, like uh, anything like a sip or something. What if that ever happened? You know, that thought, that fleeting thought, like, hey, that beer kind of looks good. Jeez, must taste good. But then I have that thought. It's like, Nick, you're an alcoholic. And when you finally admit that, hey, I can't have it. So how do you resist? Yeah, I go, I'm an alcoholic and I can't drink. No. Mm -mm." Do you, when you work at uh, the bars that you work, you've only worked at one bar or a few? I've worked at a few now. Okay, when you work at bars, have you ever seen other people from AA that relapse that are in their drinking? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. One and, guy. And do you end up having to serve them? <laughs> you know, like yes, like uh, uh, one time. Do they re- recognize? Oh, you? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Do they think that you're not sober because you're working at the and bar? They'll, they'll be like, "How do you do this? Like this is baffling. Like how do you like do this? Like how do you work at a bar and still do this?" It's like, I I tell them I go, I try to not be so promotive or anything. I just kind of keep the conversation between me and that person. I go, you know. I go, dude, you know, I just have admitted that I'm an alcoholic. My life's unmanageable, and I did my steps. And because I know for mine, and I, and when I surrendered, I was done. No reservations of any Good. kind. No that's, reservations that's the, of that's, any kind. That is the way that recovery works best, is when you can actually put any reservations you may have in the back of your head out on the table. Yeah. And put them aside and, and, and really, make a decision. And ask yourself, if you think you're that much of a normie or something like that where you think oh you know i may be able to have a drink you know i think i do well that to me that's deadly (laughs) to me absolutely um do you you had mentioned that sometimes you do will have to 12 step some people that are in in bars that are smashed yes 
how do you do that? You tell them like, uh, you might want to check out Alcoholics Anonymous. Or nah, what? no, I don't. I don't do that. No, that's very, what do you do? So here's what I do. I've had people offer me, you know, a drink or any shot, or be like, hey, you know, I'd like to buy you a shot or anything else, and I go, unfortunately, um, thank you for the offer, but uh, you know, as due to result to where I work here, um, we're not allowed to have any alcohol on the job on the clock at all. And they're like, well, other bars do it. I'm like, they're not supposed to. Yeah. Due to alcohol and beverage uh, control, you're not. No. Like if someone from like, you know, the. Uh, so do you reveal to them, though, that you're sober? So here's how it all goes. Basically, uh, I'll sit there and they'll go, well, you know, I insist. Could you, you know, I like to really do that. I go, unfortunately, thank you for the offer again, but I don't drink. I gave up. I gave up drinking over, you know, this amount of time now. And I'm, you know, still still like that. And they go. What do you mean? You gave up drinking like completely like we're like how I go. I mean, I'm sober. Yeah, I gave it up. I'm I'm a recovering alcoholic. And then they go. And some of them went like this. They were like, are you a friend of Bell's? <laughs> so they know. Yeah, they knew. And then they were like, oh, my God, I was going to those meetings, too, man. Like everything else. And oh, my God, no way. And then. That's where the twelve stepping comes out into play, you know. And, and then you can have a little conversation. Oh yeah, with little them. conversation without directly saying you need to go to AA. Yeah, no, I don't say that. I do not. Yeah. That's that's a very like a hot button. You just don't try and convince because it could really come back to you in a negative way, you mm -hmm. know. And it's by them. Yeah, or by them, or by a manager, or anything else. Like, it's yeah, like, the managers don't want. Yeah, exactly. There's a bar in Orange, California, that if you. Uh, if you take your AA chips there, they'll give you a drink. <laughs> they don't want you to go to AA. They don't want you to get sober. <laughs> so they'll give you a drink. You can, yeah, you can take well, your 30-day chip, your newcomer chip. You can take your one-year chip and be like, I'm going to turn this in. Oh, drinks. Yeah, but, you know, it's um, it's come to the point, and that's where, you know, I always wondered why God, my higher power, or my own understanding basically – had me start working in a food and beverage at a bar, you know, when I was back in 2016, when I had to finally find a s second job and be able to live on my own for the first time. Cause I lived with my parents for such a while. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I started working as a bar back and then that led me the drive to be able to want to become a bartender. Cause my, over, my mom always said, you'd be a great bartender cause you're friendly. And I see some of your stuff on Facebook. Yeah, you'd be like, uh -huh. Doing it's, the old Tom Cruise fine. tequila. Yeah, like it's great. The movie Sunrise. Cocktail. Cocktail, that's what it was. Great movie, by the way. Juggling and, shit. Yeah. And so so I want to ask you, Nick, do you love your life? Uh I seriously. Do you love I, do you love the man who you've become? I, yes. Are yes. you thinking about settling down anytime? <laughs> get, get, getting married, having a kid, or no? Are you just gonna be a lone wolf? <laughs> <laughs> a lone lion. <laughs> lone lion. Okay. Are you gonna stay single forever? Oh, I don't know, I mean, man. You're, you're kinda, I don't know, man. I, I think, I, I, I think you're a good catch. I, I I love my life so much, man. That basically, it's like uh, I always wondered why I stayed single for so long. And still are you single am. right now? Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Seriously, single. I would think women are throwing themselves. Oh, at you. oh yeah, dude. It's like no joke because because I, I mean, I, with a beard like that. Oh yeah. You'd be at the grocery store and like <laughs> just like. Oh, it's awesome, some, man. Some... It's so awesome because of this, from my struggles and also, uh, because I'm a very independent person. Mm -hmm. I love to be alone a lot. Yeah. To the point where I just get my. You know, my peace and my surround. I'll stay at the beach for hours just Medi getting med tan because I can get tan. Yeah. Dark. It's, it's, I, it's that Brazilian and, blood. Yeah. And I love fitness because I go to the gym alone. I do a lot of, love to do a lot of things independently. That's just who. You go to the movies alone? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Because of really, that comes from a lot of the times where I just, I didn't like, I'll go to my mom, go with my mom places, no big deal, like, and do the thing, but. My younger brother too, but there was a lot of times where I didn't really like bringing my dad places at all because it was like you have a better relationship with your dad these days. Uh, yes, I do. Yes, okay. I do. And your mom, obviously, you have oh, a very always, good. Always, always. My dad lives in West Palm Beach, Florida. Now he moved from California. Is your mom proud of you for being sober? Oh yeah, my mom really is really proud of me for being sober, and uh, 
It's. I think the streets of Orange County are safer. Oh now. yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. I was the guy that drank and drove a lot too. You got sober as a youngster. Yeah, at 25. Yeah, I'm super grateful because when I got sober at that age, people were like, you know, I didn't know you were that had bad and bad of a drinking problem, Nick. Like blah blah blah. I was like, I just I, they don't know the deep inside demons I was going through with like family and just myself too and just really putting everything that was important in my life on the back burner. Like, yeah, I'll go back to that later. I mean, I just want to drink and do all that and everything else. And it was just, I just, I had no direction. Like if you and had asked you, me. And what, now, now you have a direction. Yeah. If I, you asked me what my goals were, what I wanted to do, I couldn't give you a straight answer. Not zero at all. Awesome. Finally, we had you on here. We got to hear more about you. I got to learn more about you. Yeah. Um, do me a favor, uh, put some good energy out into the universe. Let people know if anyone's struggling out there with alcoholism or addiction, what, what would you like to tell them? Here's what I would like to say. All right. If any of you out there are struggling with alcohol addiction, any kind of, you know, drug addiction of any kind, I do everything alcoholically from alcohol to drugs. They're all a drug. I was an alcoholic. I did everything to the extreme. If you are out there struggling, you're not alone. There is hope out there. I'm a, I am was a hopeless variety that finally found hope at age 25, and I've stayed sober since. And there is, you, you do have a purpose, and there is a better life for you out there. I was the guy that never thought I would be able to have any uh, life, any good life out there for me. And you know what? And you can be okay with your own self. No matter what people are telling you what you should be or you should be this or, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. It's all bullshit. You can do anything you put your mind to. And, I, and I'm a living proof of that. Awesome. And I can be able to do anything and you can too. So if you're struggling, reach out to me or anyone that, Paz or anybody you know that may be in sobriety of recovery of any kind of fellowship, 12-step uh, fellowship. We, we'd be happy to help. And it's just, it just takes that one step of reaching out for help. And my job is to helping the next alcoholic that's still struggling and be the responsible for the AA hand where it needs to be. For that, I am grateful. All right. Thanks, Nick. And this has been another episode of Peggy's Recovery Corner. I uh, appreciate you guys for tuning in. Uh, I want to thank my friend Nick for coming on today. Thank you, Pej. Also, uh, the channel, please uh, subscribe to this channel. Um, it is on Pej Interventions, and Pej's Recovery Corner is a podcast, a recovery podcast that we do every week. Also, please like us and share it with other people. And until we meet again, much love to all of you, and thank you, Nick. Bye, God.